Welcome to this, the fourth and final session of the Daniel Editions, an introduction to the Apocrypha. In this session, we're going to read Bell and the Dragon, but we're also going to take one more shot at interpreting the visions of the last half of the book of Daniel. But we begin, as always, with a prayer. O oh God, our Father, open our eyes and enlighten our minds as we study your word. So grant that our minds may know your truth, and our hearts may feel your love, and then confirm and strengthen our wills, that we may go out to live what we have learned. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we have said, the book of Daniel is an apocalypse. The last half of the book is made up of a series of visions that we summarized in session three, but didn't spend much time trying to provide interpretations. For a few minutes, we're going to discuss the visions from the last half of the book of Daniel. We aren't going to talk in detail about all the visions, but I want to focus a little bit on chapter 7, then we'll talk about a few others. Uh, chapter 7 is sometimes called the hinge point of the book. It's written in Aramaic like most of chapter 2 through chapter 6, but like chapters 8 through 12, it's not a court story. It's a story of visions. Chapter 7 also takes up the Four Kingdom theme that started up in Chapter 2 that's carried on through the rest of the last half of the book. The basically reasonable kings of the first six chapters have disappeared, and now we encounter the arch-tyrant whose death is the only basis of hope. Chapter 7 has attracted a great deal of attention for its potential contribution to understanding of the use of the term Son of Man in the New Testament. There are a lot of theories, the issue being whether or not this Jesus of Mark's use of the phrase Son of Man is a reference to the book of Daniel's use, one like a Son of Man, in chapter 7. There is a context of suffering in both cases. Jesus would have been aware of the Daniel visions, but Ezekiel also uses the phrase Son of Man, so it's not necessarily the case that the Jesus of Mark used the phrase Son of Man as derived from Daniel. In so far as I can tell, there's no clear consensus among biblical scholars on this issue. Dr. Gowan, whose commentary we're using, doesn't even pretend to deal with the question except for shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire in Hebrews 11. The stories of Daniel 1 through 6 are not used in the New Testament. But the visions and Nebuchadnezzar's dream from chapter 2 have played an important role in New Testament thought. The imminent coming of an eternal kingdom is prominent both in the book of Daniel as well as the New Testament. It may be that the book of Daniel influenced the writings of the book of the New Testament, but it didn't do so as explicitly as, say, the book of Isaiah, which is directly quoted frequently in Mark, Luke, Matthew, Romans, and several other books of the New Testament. Daniel's vision in chapter 7 has four scenes. The four beasts, the ancient one, the destruction of the fourth beast, and the one like a human being. Daniel asks for and gets an explanation about the four beasts and the gift of the kingdom, and then a more detailed explanation of the fourth kingdom. The four beasts that arose from the sea included a lion-like creature that clearly represented Babylon. The little horn on the fourth beast was identified with Antichus IV Epiphanes, which meant that the fourth beast would have represented the Hellenistic period that began with Alexander. There is no consensus on the ten horns and then the three. The fourth beast wasn't associated with a particular animal, perhaps because it represented a European origin, Greece, while the other three were Asiatic empires. The imagery makes it clear that it is God who ascends the throne in the second scene, the Ancient One. God is the Ancient One. There are open books which are records that are to become the basis for judgment. In the third scene, one like the Son of Man appeared, one like a human as opposed to beasts or God. The human becomes the holy ones of the Most High. We are told that the little horn, that is Atticus, 
is making war on the Holy Ones, which could be the angels or the faithful Jews. It's not clear. The attack on the Holy Ones is said to be an affront against God himself. The decision of Antichrist to end the worship of Yahweh was seen as an effort to attack Yahweh himself. But victory over the tyrant is assured after a period that has often been interpreted as three and a half years. That is one set time, two set times, and a half a set time. Often we see in the Bible that the defeat of Israel is a part of God's plan. God used Assyria to conquer Israel, or God used Babylon as an agent to punish the Judeans for not following the covenant. But the vision in chapter 7 sees the succession of empires as a history, no longer God's work, but of evil powers. The fourth empire is more evil than the rest, and the tyrant is no agent of God. Chapter 7 and the subsequent chapters were written in a time of persecution to offer hope for an end of suffering. In the session three handout, we said that the Ptolemies were the kings of the south in the chapter 11 visions, and the Seuclids were the kings of the north. We also read in chapter 11 about the king of the north who shall be enraged and take action against the Holy Covenant. He shall turn back and pay heed to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Forces sent by him shall occupy and profane the temple and fortress. They shall abolish the regular burnt offering and set up the abomination that makes desolate. This was clearly describing Atticus 4. There are some other visions that we can figure out ourselves with a little bit of effort, but we won't do that here. Instead, we now go to Bell and the Dragon. Bell and the Dragon can be treated as chapter 14 of the book of Daniel, although sometimes it is placed after chapter 6, following the story where Daniel is thrown into a pit of lions. The story of Bell and the Dragon is made up of two idol parodies. It's not known exactly when it was written, but it could have been as early as the Persian period, 538 to 333 BCE, or maybe during the 2nd century. It was probably added to the book of Daniel late in the second century. So we begin with verse 1 and 2. This is Bell and the Dragon. When King Astagius was laid to rest with his ancestors, Cyrus the Persian succeeded to his kingdom. Daniel was a companion of the king and was the most honored of all his friends. Sertaxus was king of the Median Empire from 625 to 585 BCE. He was succeeded by his son Astagius, who was king until 550 BCE, when he was defeated by Cyrus the Great of Persia. Cyrus also conquered the Libyan Empire in 546, and finally the Babylonian Empire in 539. Again, the storyline in Daniel is confusing when we try to match it up with well-known historical facts. Cyrus the Great was son of Cambius I, king of Ashan, from 580 to 559, and the grandson of Cyrus I, 600 to 580. Cambius I was married to Astagius' daughter. This would make Cyrus the Great the grandson of Astagius. Persopolis, the capital of Persia, which is Iran, was east of the Persian Gulf. Babylon is northwest of the Persian Gulf, about 540 miles northwest of Persopolis. The capital of the Median Empire was at Batana, directly north of the Persian Gulf, several hundred miles northeast of Babylon. The story that we told seems to be one which is all the activity takes place in Babylon. Only the kings change, but each of these empires has its own capital city. So after Cyrus defeated Nabonius, the last of the Babylonian kings, or earlier after he defeated Astegis, the Median king, he didn't set up his palace in Babylon. If Daniel was in the court of Cyrus, he may have moved to Persopolis, east of the Persian Gulf. If he'd been serving the Median king, he likely would have moved to Batana in Medea, but we seem to still be in Babylon. 
Cyrus was succeeded by his son Cambius II in 530. Cambius II died in 522 and was followed by Darius I of Persia, who had been his lance bearer and claimed to be a distant cousin of Cyrus. Cyrus, Cambius, and Darius I all spent some time in Babylon, but that was not always their headquarters. Much of the time was spent out on campaigns to conquer other lands or trying to hold on to territories already a part of their empires. They weren't always in Babylon. But we go on with verses 3 through 9. Now the Babylonians had an idol called Bel, and every day they provided for it 12 bushels of choice flour, and 40 sheep, and six measures of wine. The king revered it and went every day to worship it, but Daniel worshipped his own god. So the king said to him, Why do you not worship Bel? He answered, Because I do not revere idols made with hands, but the living God who created heaven and earth and has dominion over all living creatures. The king said to him, do you not think that Bel is a living God? Do you not see how much he eats and drinks every day? And Daniel laughed and said, Do not be deceived, O king, for this thing is only clay inside and bronze outside, and it never ate or drank anything. Then the king was angry and called the priests of Bel and said to them, If you do not tell me who is eating these provisions, you shall die. But if you prove that Bel is eating them, Daniel shall die, because he has spoken blasphemy against Bel. Daniel said to the king, Let it be done as you have said. Bel was probably another name for Marduk, the god who headed the Babylonian Pantheon, or temple. In actual practice, the leftovers that the god didn't eat were sent to the king, and eating them was said to provide blessings. The fact that Daniel laughed show his familiarity with the king. If he hadn't had a good relationship, he might have had his head chopped off for laughing at the king. We go on with verse 10 through 15. Now there were 70 priests of Bel, beside their wives and children. So the king went with Daniel into the temple of Bel. The priests of Bel said, See, we are now going outside. You yourself, O king, set out the food and prepare the wine and shut the door and seal it with your signet. When you return in the morning, if you do not find that Bel has eaten it all, we will die. Otherwise, Daniel will, who is telling lies about us. They were unconcerned, for beneath the table they had made a hidden entrance, through which they used to go in regularly and consume the provisions. After they had gone out, the king set out the food for Bel. Then Daniel ordered his servants to bring ashes, and they scattered them throughout the whole temple in the presence of the king alone. Then they went out, shut the door, and sealed it with the king's signet, and departed. During the night the priests came as usual with their wives and children, and they ate and drank everything. So they would typically prepare the wine, as it says in verse 10, by mixing it with water or spices. In chapters 1 through 6 of Daniel, he relied on divine revelation. Here, as in Susanna, Daniel seems to rely on his wits. This sounds more like a Sherlock Holmes mystery story, spreading ashes on the floor to solve the mystery of the locked room. So we go on with verses 16 through 18. Early in the morning, the king rose and came, and Daniel with him. The king said, Are the seals unbroken, Daniel? He answered, They are unbroken, O king. As soon as the doors were opened, the king looked at the table and shouted in a loud voice, You are great, O Bel, and in you there is no deceit at all. So the doors had remained sealed all night, and the food is gone. Bel must have eaten it. Now on to verses 9 through 19 through 22. But Daniel laughed and restrained the king from going in. Look at the floor, he said, and notice whose footprints these are. The king said, I see footprints of men and women and children. Then the king was enraged, and he arrested the priests and their wives and children. They showed him the secret doors through which they used to enter and consume what was on the table. Therefore the king put them to death and gave Bel over to Daniel. 
who destroyed it and its temple. So Daniel laughs again here. Um, and the king follows up by showing his anger. Just like in the story of Susanna, the culprits are put to death. And like the story of Daniel and the lion's den in the chapter 6, their wives and children are put to death as well. According to the Greek historian Herodotus, Bel's idol and temple were destroyed by the Persian king Xerxes in 479 BC. The statue of Bel was melted into 800 pounds of gold bullion. So Daniel's actions respond to Babylon's destruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem in 586. So we go on to another short story about a dragon this time. Dragons or snakes were often symbolic of the divine in the ancient Near East. So uh, verses 23 through 27. Now in that place, there was a great dragon which the Babylonians revered. The king said to Daniel, You cannot deny that this is a living God, so worship him. Daniel said, I worship the Lord my God, for he is the living God. But give me permission, O king, and I will kill the dragon without sword or club. The king said, I give you permission. Then Daniel took pitch, fat, and hair, and boiled them together and made cakes, which he fed to the dragon. The dragon ate them and burst open. Then Daniel said, See what you have been worshiping? So the dragon or the snake, unlike the idol, Bell was living. The dragon was alive. Daniel talked about worshiping a living God. The dragon was living, but it was not a god. The mixture of pitch and hair and fat would not necessarily be toxic. Maybe the dragon just ate too much of it. Nevertheless, the dragon eats and dies, unlike Bell, who was destroyed because he couldn't eat. We go on with 28 through 30. When the Babylonians heard about it, they were very indignant and conspired against the king, saying, The king has become a Jew. He has destroyed Bell and killed the dragon and slaughtered the priests. Going to the king, they said, Hand Daniel over to us, or we will kill you and your household. The king saw that they were pressing him hard, and under compulsion, he handed Daniel over to them. So here we have the king threatened by his own people, just like Darius in chapter 6. The king doesn't want to hand Daniel over, but they have him boxed into a corner with no other way out. So we go on with verse 31 through 32. They threw Daniel into the lion's den, and he was there for six days. There were seven lions in the den, and every day they had been given two human bodies and two sheep, but now they were given nothing so that they would devour Daniel. So the author is still interested in dietary matters. First we had the idol Bell who couldn't eat, the dragon who ate and died, and now we are starving the lions so they'll be hungry enough to eat Daniel. But here the eating story will be related to the miraculous. If you remember in chapter 1 of Daniel, Daniel and his friends wanted a special diet. In chapter 5, Belshazzar was destroyed because of his blasphemous feast. But now we go on with verses 33 through 36. Now the prophet Habakkuk was in Judea. He had made a stew and had broken bread into a bowl and was going into the field to take it to the reapers. But the angel of the Lord said to Habakkuk, Take the food that you have to Babylon, to Daniel, in the lion's den. Habakkuk said, Sir, I have never seen Babylon, and I know nothing about the den. Then the angel of the Lord took him by the crown of his head and carried him by his hair. With the speed of the wind, set him down in Babylon, right over the den. So we seem to have had a little bit of humor here. If you remember, Habakkuk was one of the minor prophets who prophesied in Judea about 612 through 597, prior to the exile. 
well before the events that are recounted here. This little episode also involves food, although it's the lions, not Daniel, that are really the major food problem here. Uh, we go on with verses 37 through the end of the story. Then Habakkuk shouted, Daniel, Daniel, take the food that God has sent you. Daniel said, You have remembered me, O God, and have not forsaken those who love you. So Daniel got up and ate, and the angel of God immediately returned Habakkuk to his own place. On the seventh day, the king came to mourn for Daniel. When he came to the den, he looked in, and there sat Daniel. The king shouted with a loud voice, You are great, O Lord, the God of Daniel, and there is no other besides you. Then he pulled Daniel out and threw into the den those who had attempted his destruction, and they were instantly eaten before his eyes. So at the very end, we have another food episode. Uh, the lions finally get to eat. The obvious lesson of this story, like most of the Daniel stories, is that one must be faithful to the one living God. Daniel refused to worship an idol, Bell or the dragon. The Lord kept him safe from the jaws of the hungry lions. Earlier we read how the three young Jews refused to worship a statue made up by King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and were thrown into a fiery furnace. In chapter 6, Daniel refused to worship King Darius and was thrown into a lion pit. Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar disrespected the one true God and were punished. Susanna remained faithful to the law and was vindicated. The story of Bel illustrates how silly it is to worship something that man has created with his own hands. And the dragon story concurs that it's just as foolish to worship one of the creatures God has created. Jews should simply stay with the source, the one God, the one that created all and was all. So this probably wasn't just an attack on heathen worship. It may also have had some edifying aspects for idolatrous Jews. In the extreme, the stories show that there is no point in worshiping anyone or anything other than the living God. For Jews who were living in the diaspora, there was a great temptation to worship along with their Gentile neighbors. When they didn't, they oftentimes suffered both religiously and economically. It would have been highly edifying to hear the story where Daniel stood up against these idolatrous cults and was protected by the God for his stance. The addition of all these stories shows that there was a great interest in the figure of Daniel. In fact, scholars have discovered several other Daniel compositions at Qumran. It seems that these stories were both edifying and entertaining. Though the details cannot be verified, these stories suggest there was a very close relationship between Daniel and the king. Daniel chuckles, restrains him from entering the temple, and lives to tell about it. This would indicate the relationship was both intimate and long-standing. In this study, we have tried to provide some background for the book of Daniel without reading the entire book and discussing all the details. We've talked about the period of the exile in the Second Temple period and have included some history on the second century BCE when Antichus was a tyrant, Sucleid king, who defiled the Temple of Jerusalem. We've read and discussed the prayer of Azariah and the song of the three Jews, Susanna and Bell and the dragon, additions that appear in the Greek Septuagint, but not in the original Hebrew version of the book of Daniel that we're most familiar with. I welcome your comments or suggestions and hope to see you Monday evening for a final discussion session. In the meantime, keep your masks on and stay safe.